to share them. We're actually going to be recording this because the, um, the, um, the experience and background of these presenters is actually pretty significant, and we want the opportunity to be able to share this information later. And then with the concern of having a quorum, we could not have all the council members here, so it's an opportunity for us to actually use this, um, use this evening over and over again. I'm Kalua Barnes, and I'm the Director of Community Engagement. about Daniel's exuberance. I love working um, with you. <laughs> it is great to see so many of you here tonight who extended your pretty long day to come tonight and hear this conversation. We've got two really um, passionate and experienced professionals to talk about community cohesion, um, its, uh, its impact on disaster recovery and connectedness. So before we get started, though, I want to actually take an opportunity. I think most of you will have heard some conversation or some part of this discussion today about the program that the city of Santa Rosa was conceived so I'm going to take a few minutes and have folks kind of introduce themselves, and then you'll know who's in the room and who are kind of interested stakeholders in this process. So Jim, we'll start over on that side. Hi, Jim Folks. Uh, organization? Uh, I'm San Jose City Board. Okay. Karen Demarest, Community Foundation of Sermon County. Anna Lugo, uh, Director of Communications at the Community Action Partnership, Class of Sure. Sheree Barnett, Chair of the City of San Jose Community Advisory Board. Steve Mencher, News Director of KRC. Hi, I'm Chris Crowley. I'm serving as the Interim Emergency Manager for Sonoma County. John Kessel, and I'm in the newly created Office of Recovery and Residency for the County of Sonoma. And we get Michelle. Michelle Whitman from the Office of Sonoma County Supervisor Shirley Zane. Deborah Crippen. I'm from the West End Neighborhood Association. Uh, Jason Carter, Violence Prevention Manager for the Office of Community Engagement. Jennifer Rock, Sonoma County Administrator's Office. I'm Mahana Yusser with Sonoma County's Office of Recovery and Resiliency. I'm Jamie Holmes with Catholic Charities, but also the City of San Jose Community Advisory Board. <clears throat> Chris Rogers, Vice Mayor for the City. James Cooper, Red Cross. Neil Bragman, Emergency Manager for Santa Rosa. Adrian Martins, Communications Officer for City. Paul Walthall, San Jose Fire. Uh, Susan Cooper, Executive Director, Community Action Partnership. Mike Barella, Board Member for the Rift Ways Historic Neighborhood Association, also a Program Manager for Via San Jose. Yeah. Anne Marie Brown with Santa Rosa Community Health. And so before we get started, I want you to look around and kind of see these are the partners and, and stakeholders who might make this possible for the city of Santa Rosa and for the County of Sonoma. <laughs> So as I was talking about this program, and we've been working on it, um, our office has been kind of conceiving an idea, built off the model um, used in San Francisco, and the level of interest has actually been pretty uh, overwhelming and impressive. So the opportunity tonight to have Daniel Aldrich, Dr. Daniel Aldrich and Daniel Holmesy here to talk about their programs is, we hope, really beneficial. There'll be a period of about half an hour for each one of the presentations, and then we'll have an opportunity for Q&A at the end. And on the table are some post-it notes just to take notes. There's nothing. Um, we've got the microphones that we'll pass around to share so they want to hear the questions. And then uh, from there, we'll, we'll wrap it up. So I think that they've got some really powerful statements about cohesion, connectedness, and resilience. So starting with Daniel Aldrich. And Dr. Aldrich has a pretty phenomenal um, record. He is um, the Director of Security and Resilience Studies program and a full professor of policy and political science at Northwestern University, Northeastern University. He's published four books, Fight Fights, Building Resilience, Resilience and Recovery in Asian Disasters, and Healthy Resilience and Sustainable Communities After Disasters, with the fifth book, Black Way Forthcoming. Uh, the recipient of two Fulbright Fellowships, an AIDS Fellowship, and American Association for the Advancement of Science and Technology Fellowship, the Kenley Trust Fellowship, and the Phi Sigma Alpha Best Professor Award. He's also published more than 45 peer-reviewed articles, along with the op-eds in the New York Times, the CNN, um, Washington Post, the uh, Asahi Shinbun, which is the Japanese newspaper. Um, Audrey is the chair of the American Political Science Association's Working Group on Disasters and Crises, and sits on the editorial board of several uh, journals. 
So welcome, welcome me, um, welcome Dr. Aldrich to the floor. Thank you all very much. That's a good picture, thank you. Okay, so <clears throat> to begin, my Twitter and email are on the board. In case you have any questions that I can't answer tonight, feel free to email me. I'm also on Twitter all the time, so please don't Twitter me too much, but a little bit maybe. You know, for me, this field of resilience and recovery began as a personal one, actually, not professionally. Uh, in the summer of 2005, we had moved down to New Orleans, Louisiana, in the mid of middle of July, around the 17th or so. I, my wife and I had two kids, two small kids, four and two at the time, and we moved to an area called Lakeview, which really was Lakeview. You could see the lake from our house. And after about five and a half good weeks in New Orleans, Hurricane Katrina arrived on the 28th of August. The levees broke near our house. Our house was filled with around 14 feet of water. And we had to evacuate very early Sunday morning with around a million other people. We spent about four and a half months out of New Orleans, wandering around the country, wondering what to do next. Came back to New Orleans for a few months and then began life elsewhere after that. But in that period between the destruction of our home and finding another job, was this strange moment of dislocation and also a lot of reading because I wanted to understand what do the academics claim happened after disaster? What factors would give my family, my neighborhood, and my city the ability to bounce back, the ability to have resilience? And in fact, in that period, I began with Rick Wheel of LSU, a process of trying to use my social science skills to understand this more broadly. So this is one of the maps that we built uh, in 2006 less than a year after Hurricane Katrina. And it's got three types of data. So one is the obvious geography. So if you've ever been to New Orleans, you might recognize this. Which river is this, by the way? Mississippi, very good. Up here at the top, what lake is that? Monster Train, you got it? Good, all right, excellent. Beyond geography, we also have water depth. The colors in the background tell you how much water was there. So the very, very white areas here at the bottom this is a less than two feet of water. The yellowy areas here, this is two to five feet of water. The light blue areas that you see throughout the city are five to seven feet, and the darker blues are eight feet and more. My house, by the way, was up here on Canal Boulevard, right about there. We also added one more layer of data, which was how the recoveries were going. So we asked around 1,000 people living in New Orleans on a scale of one to five, one being really, really bad, and five being great. How's the recovery going for you? And we got these answers back. You can see them all here on the map. Again, from one being not recovered to five being fully recovered. Now, I assumed the following pattern would hold. I assumed that in areas with more water, we would see less recovery. If you had 12 feet of water, I thought it would take you more time to bounce back than one foot of water. You guys are all smart. You're building a community again here. You tell me, what pattern do you see here connecting how much damage was done to how recoveries were perceived. Michelle, what do you think? I can't make heads or tails out of it. Yeah, neither could we, actually. And we studied this in different ways. Logistic regression, we used OLS, GIS regression. Turns out, in fact, the relationship between damage and recovery is pretty much non-existent. On a scale of 0 to 1, it's around a 0.2. What we actually didn't find was what I thought we would find, which is that these dark blue areas should be all red. So let's take this pattern here, for example. This area is called Village de l'Est. <clears throat> they had roughly 12 feet of water in their backyards. Every single home, every business was shut down. But this community here bounced back within about four months. The rest of us were still in shock at that point. Not only that, but look at the clustering that you see. Not a single non-green or yellow dot here. Right? Track down to the areas which have less damage at the bottom here, right? these more isolated homes. A lot of oranges and yellows here, quite surprising actually. So this is the first thought that I had, that maybe resilience, the ability to bounce back, isn't a function of damage. Whether the home was partially damaged or fully damaged, maybe here you can appreciate, fully destroyed or partially destroyed. And the more time I spent thinking about the models that we had in academia for recovery, the more I thought they missed the point. And I would argue if there's only one message to take away from tonight, it's the following. What we found first in New Orleans and then in Japan, and then in Israel, India, North America, the Gulf Coast, California as well, New Zealand, has been the following. What really drives recovery 
are the connections between us. Not money from insurance companies, not money from FEMA, not how much money you had before grant or demographics. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. But what really drives this are the kind of connections that we have. And there are three types that we classify them into. One is called bonding social capital. These are the connections between individuals who are quite similar. Meaning, for example, if you're a middle class Patnavar caste fisherman in India, most of your friends are Patnavar caste fishermen in India. If you're a middle class white person living in Santa Rosa, most of your friends are probably middle class white people living in Santa Rosa. So that's bonding social capital. Homophily means people in your network are like you. Occasionally we bridge beyond our own ethnicity, race, background, religion, and so forth. We make friends through work, through clubs, through religious institutions, maybe through an interest, bocce ball, kendo, soccer. We call those bridging ties, right? Those are also horizontal ties. And finally, occasionally we have what we call linking social ties. These are vertical ties between someone who's a normal citizen like me and someone perhaps in the governor's office or someone in the president's cabinet or someone in FEMA, right? Three types of ties. How do they make a difference during disaster? The first choice we have to make post-disaster, and you can see this right now happening outside the doors here, is exit or voice. Does someone with a destroyed home, with a destroyed business, come back and rebuild? Or do they leave the area and go someplace else? What would drive you to come back? Well, a lot of things could, be, could stop you from coming back. For example, the costs involved. We know there are financial costs between the amount of money you get from insurance and the actual rebuilding cost is often a gap. It's a financial cost. There are psychological costs. Being back in an area where you suffered a trauma, you lost a pet, a family member was killed, your vineyards are destroyed, your house is gone, you watch someone you know get hurt, right? The psychological costs can last for months. We'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. And there are opportunity costs as well. Every day you're in a damaged area with no clients, no businesses, no schools open, you could be someplace else having a successful business or open school, right? So we know there are very heavy costs. So if that's the case then, we should see exit a lot, meaning you would get up and go and not coming back. You'd let the house go, declare bankruptcy, let the mortgage go, or, or move someplace else. But what we found, though, is some communities come back despite the damage, despite the costs. What brought them back? Well, interviews with people around the world, the most common answer is a sense of belonging, a sense of place. That means whatever the financial, psychological opportunity costs are there, you still believe it's worth coming back. Whatever much time it will take or how much out of pocket you have to pay, if you believe New Orleans is your home or Santa Rosa is your home, you will pay those costs and you will pay them happily because you'd rather be home again with your voice in the community working together again to build. What we found around the world was communities that are tighter knit, more bonding and bridging ties, they have more voice. Communities that are more atomized, more fragmented, less connections, those communities have more exit. That's the first thing that we've seen. The second reason it works, collective action. Many of the challenges post-disaster cannot be solved by one family, one individual by themselves. A simple, brutal example came from Haiti in 2011 with the, with the earthquake there. After the government literally was destroyed by the earthquake, law enforcement personnel went there. How do you protect your family from looters and thieves? You need to work together as a community. You need to form patrols. If you can't do that, you're going to be away all the time to keep the bad guys away. That's one example. And the other end would be, Home values. How do you make sure that your home value rises again? Making sure the debris is gone. There are trees and grass back in your neighborhood again. If you're the only person back in your neighborhood and all the other homes are gone, much more challenging to get property values back up to where they used to be. So many of these problems have to be solved by collective action. How do you build that? The easiest way is with social ties. Meaning you have people in your network that you know and trust, you can work together more easily. The third and final mechanism we see social capital working through is called informal insurance or mutual aid. This means the kind of resources that we normally get, childcare, food, a place to stay, information, psychological support, they're often shut down post-disaster. It might be days or weeks before you have gas stations, before you had food stores, schools, kindergartens might be open only after a few months. What do you do in the meantime? If you're very, very lucky and you still have a job, and you have kids with you, you have a neighbor, a friend, a grandparent, somebody who can take care of the kids during the week. Information doesn't come from neighbors nearby. Tools, ideas, those will come from people that you know already. If you've invested time and effort in building relationships before the disaster, you can draw on them as informal insurance after the disaster. If the first time you meet someone is post-disaster, there's less psychological space and less time to build those ties. 
So in communities around the world that have stronger ties, there's more stock of informal insurance that helps them draw on informal insurance resources and assistance. This is all pretty abstract. I want to give you some data now that we've collected, at least from one set of examples in Japan. Roughly seven years ago, on March the 11th, 2011, at 2.46 p.m. in the afternoon, we saw a massive offshore earthquake of 9.0, powerful enough to make the Earth jump off its axis. We had about 15 meters of movement in the undersea plates. And roughly 40 minutes later, this, at this time, was really short, but eventually a 60-foot wall of water came ashore. Now, this image is misleading. What you see now is the leading edge of the tsunami. Notice how it's not wet back here yet. So this is actually a 30-foot seawall. This is the very first swell from the tsunami before the actual arrival. And of course, the cars along the way are being destroyed here. 18,000 and other people lost their lives in the tsunami, $275 billion worth of damage. But the interesting thing about the tsunami, and by the way, I forgot to mention the nuclear meltdowns also came with this, was that the mortality rates across the area did not match the height of the tsunami. That is to say, in the 140 communities along the coast, some had no casualties, some lost a tenth of their population. We simply graphed here a number of these communities here. The bottom axis, the x-axis is the height in meters. So Tanohata has a 20 meter, which is 60 feet. Tagajo had four meters, which is around 12 feet. And the y-axis is the percentage of people killed there. So Onagawa, Otsuchi, Rikas, and Takata had death rates around 11%. Rifu, Natori, around 9%. Tagajo, around 2.5%. But notice there's no great pattern here. Right? It's not that every single community that had a higher tsunami had higher death rates. Tanohata's death rate was quite low. Uh, same as Watadicho. Rifu, again, very short tsunami. So just like in New Orleans, where the outcome of the tsunami, the outcome of the disaster, didn't predict what was going to happen, here, too, the height itself wasn't enough to talk about things. So I spent about a year and a half in Japan the first time talking with people, trying to understand what's driving then mortality. What helps people get through this kind of event? There are five major categories of explanations that I heard. The most common was the power of the tsunami, which I've already explained doesn't make any sense. The next one is more cynical. Here's the argument. In Japan, one political party has controlled the system for a long time. If your community did not support that community, then perhaps over time you'd lose money for fire prevention, for disaster prevention, for drilling, and so forth. So a cynical perspective would be the local political party could drive how much money you got beforehand and maybe affect how you survived. It's pretty cynical, I like that. Um, another argument came from the engineers nearby. They argued that what matters during a disaster comes from the amount of concrete between you and the, and the threat. How many pounds of concrete were poured to make that seawall? That should make you safer. Another argument is demographics. Communities with the elderly should be the ones that die more often. Or perhaps we could bring back the idea of social ties. How might social ties matter during a tsunami? I mentioned there's a 40 minute period between the earthquake and the arrival of the wave. 40 minutes out of time if you're young and healthy and able-bodied. You can leave your home on the seashore and walk two kilometers up to higher ground in 40 minutes easily. But if you're not able-bodied, if you're elderly, if you're infirm, if you didn't know there was an earthquake, which we actually surveyed people a third didn't know there was an earthquake, then it's much harder to escape in that period of time. So what if in that 40 minute period of time, when the earthquake has happened already, but the tsunami isn't there, your neighbors knock on your door? Your family, your friends, your caregivers recognize that you're in trouble. And they come and knock on the door, and they pick you up, and they carry you out, out to safety. It's a possibility. And what we found, in fact, was that the best predictor of surviving came from communities that had tighter social bonds. Here we're measuring this with crime rates. We could also use things like blood drives, voting, trust in government. In the communities where there were much higher rates of trust and less crime, we predict that a tsunami would only cause one in 1,000 deaths. As that rate of distrust rises in the community, it goes up to around 1 in 50 from 1 in 1,000. So measurable differences across communities in Japan where we see different levels of social capital. That was the first stage, was surviving the event. These horizontal ties make a big difference. How about in then rebuilding the process? This is a city called Ishinomaki. This image was taken about two weeks after the tsunami. This was taken two years later. So you guys tell me, has Ishinomaki recovered in that two-year period? It's a little desolate. A little desolate, right? It's cleaned up, right? The debris is gone. But this is midday. There's no bicycles. There's no foot traffic. There's no one going to the businesses. We really can't tell, right? And in fact, the more time I spent asking questions, the different answers I got, 
every field defines recovery post-disaster differently. So for example, the businesses that I asked what will recovery look like told me it will mean I've got clients again. The school said it will be kids back in seats. Engineers said it will be critical infrastructure like power lines, gas, railroads and roads being operational again. Right? And disaster managers said things like we'll have the, evac the evacuation of the features up and running again. This was Tagajo. One month, one year, two years. Now, why this white van is still there over time? <laughs> I have some theories about insurance fraud, but hard to say here. But in, in any case, again, hard to tell if they've really recovered, right? Even though now the debris is gone and they're planting again. So my colleagues and I measured 14 different types of recovery, including business, school, housing, and infrastructure recovery. And try to understand what factors drive that process. What's going to make a difference for you rebuilding your homes, your cities again? We're in the first stage, horizontal connections mattered. In this stage of recovery, vertical connections, linking ties mattered. How so? Because in this stage, you have to bring in construction firms. You need to get the attention of the ministries granting permits. You need assistance from the government to push things along. Where horizontal ties saved lives, in this stage of rebuilding, vertical ties bring more resources in to the community. One more period of time here. This is now a six year period of time about mental health. As I mentioned, the third part of the disaster were the meltdowns at Fukushima. What's going to help individuals get an even keel again with all the kind of stresses that you might have? By the way, what stress might you be feeling if a nuclear power plant melt melted down near your home? What might be on your mind? Cancer. Cancer. So health for yourself and your family. What else? Livelihoods, right? Farmers and fishermen, no one's going to buy your products again. You only had two hours to evacuate, and you left your home behind, right? On which you're paying a mortgage still, as you're living for seven years outside that. So you're, you've got a mortgage and no job. So you have livelihood concerns, health concerns, all kinds of concerns. These are the areas around this dot. That dot, the plant, the plant there, that had to evacuate. 145,000 people left their homes. So we tracked their mental health over a period of time, using a very simple index called the K6 or Kessler 6 Index. The K6 asks the following questions. Don't answer out loud, by the way. Over the last month, how often have you felt stressed? Okay. If never, the answer points you give yourself are 1. If all the time, the answer you give yourself would be 4. Okay. How often over the past month have you had problems sleeping at night? Okay. So again, we have six questions like this. The maximum scale is 24. The minimum is 0. Now, the community that lives closest is called Futaba, the top line here. Okay? And we've color-coded the four different categories of answers. F Futaba itself and two other communities, Ishinomaki, what you just saw, and Yamada. Now, these two communities at the bottom didn't have a nuclear power plant meltdown nearby, but Futaba did. So we're comparing those levels of these K6 scores of stress. The lowest category, which hopefully most of us are in, was around half the populations of Yamada, Ishinomaki, but only around a 15th, maybe, well, sorry, a 15% of Futaba. The next category of 5 to 9 was around 25% here in Yamada, around 50% Ishinomaki, only around 20% in Futaba. The third category, and by the way, psychologists would tell you this is now in terms of PTSD level, is around 7% in Futaba, 7%, 5%. But look at this biggest category here at the end, the highest level measurable of stress. Futaba has roughly 52% of the community feeling that stress. Ishinomaki and Yamada are less than 10%. So clearly, individuals who've gone through radioactive cloud have far bigger concerns than individuals who only had a tsunami and an earthquake to deal with. The bigger question is, what reduces stress? Right? If these individuals are feeling these levels of anxiety. So we first thought the answer was Donald Trump. Because we figured if you're very, very wealthy and you're in pretty good health, then that should ameliorate any effects you have from concerns about livelihood and so on. Well, in fact, that's wrong. Uh, we found no measurable impact on being very, very wealthy, or being middle class, or being poor. Everyone has the same levels of stress. And we also found being healthy didn't help. The most healthy young people that we had had the same levels of stress as very, very sick elderly people. So what's going to bring down levels of stress, do you think? Connections. Connections. Yeah, the best predictor of feeling less stress over this evacuation period and worries about your health and your livelihood and your mortgage was having neighbors that you did know, or even that you didn't know, that you interacted with regularly. 
having individuals in your network with whom you met regularly reduce stress. So I've argued so far that in the first stage of survival, in the recovery process, and then in the long-term mental health process, these ties make a difference. If that's the case, then what should we do next? If social ties drive this resilience idea, what should we be doing as people who care about recovery? So hopefully you all recognize this guy with the red sweater. Who's that man with the red sweater? Fred Rogers, right? Deceased now for about a decade, I think. But when I was a kid, he asked me every good day to be a good neighbor. Thank you, a good neighbor. So here's the simple thing. Maybe here it's different, but when I go around the world and ask this question, it's a low answer. Who in this room knows the first and last names of 10 neighbors? That's a good sign. Because around the world, the answer is around one eighth of the, of the people in the room, you believe. Right? In most metropolitan areas, Boston included, New York, Tokyo, Mumbai, Tel Aviv, most of us don't know neighbors. Why do, why do we care? Because the zero responders before the police and the fire arrive are our neighbors. The individuals knock on the doors to save lives are the neighbors. If you have a heart attack, if you die, it's your neighbor who finds their body. Right? Those are the individuals which we should be caring about. The reality is most of us don't know them. So the first programs we're using right now, for example, in New Zealand and in Boston, are the Get to Know Your Neighbors program. Building social cohesion one neighbor at a time. It sounds strange and corny, but the reality is having that tie can save lives, as we saw early on in this talk. Now, the next stage up is the neighbor fest party. You might have heard neighbor fest from my good colleague, Dan. Uh, I'm still speaking shortly. Uh, Dan has a program in San Francisco where your community applies and gets a permit to block off the streets, bring in a bounce house, play loud music, have a big party, and they agree not to exclude anyone and to have some kind of disaster awareness talk there, maybe from Red Cross, maybe from themselves, from FEMA. We found these kind of programs at the individual and the neighborhood level are critical, especially in metropolitan areas, because again, these are the areas people don't often meet each other ever, even taking out the garbage or dropping off the mail. Now, the next level up of policy recommendations is about how to rebuild. What do you do to build a society that creates more social ties? How do you create an environment, a neighborhood, where people meet more often? The easiest answer is build more public spaces, build more parks, more stadiums, build more Starbucks and third places, build more playgrounds and areas people can sit down and chat together. Again, in most metropolitan areas, we're lacking these kind of social areas. Right now in Japan, for example, we have a lot of space to rebuild. Run 47,000 square kilometers or so of space um, to rebuild. So we're trying to use our recommendations to rebuild areas that are going to be tightly integrated when they finish doing that process. This is what it looks like a very boring local meeting. Another policy we have is encouraging meeting attendance. We found individuals who attend meetings like this one, or maybe less mandatory ones, are ones that have high levels of social cohesion. Whether it's a PTA group or a land zoning meeting, communities that have more meeting attendance have more trust in each other and in local authorities. And finally, one last more active program we call community currency or time banking. The idea is very simple. Most of us don't volunteer as much as we should. And the excuse that we give is, if I volunteer for the Red Cross, for a school nearby, for an elderly home, I'll lose money, time, something like that. So we say, no problem. If you volunteer for an hour in Toronto, you get five Toronto dollars. Volunteer in Berkeley, you get five Berkeley dollars. You get the point here. Localized currencies can't be spent at McDonald's or Costco or any big chains. They're only spent locally. Farmers markets, mom and pop stores, whatever you want locally. And here's what happens. We offer this kind of exchange for volunteering. Volunteers rise up. Then they volunteer, take their currency to a local store, which gets it. That store goes to other stores, and we be begin this virtuous cycle. All five programs here, we have measurable empirical evidence. They increase trust, volunteerism, and civic engagement between 7 and 17%, depending on where we are. All of them have been proven across the world to work. Here's one war that we're trying out now. It works so well in Japan, we're building now in Nepal and the Philippines, called Ibasho. After the major disaster in Japan I just mentioned seven years ago, we knew many people were living in temporary trailer parks, like FEMA trailers in Japan, called Kasuji Jutaku. And in those communities, they simply had no space together to work. So we offered them the chance to build a community space, maybe bigger than this room, a little bit, two stories, run by the elderly. We wanted the elderly not to be victims, but to be the managers and the runners of this program. And they agreed, took a long, about six months to get it going. And everyone you see, this is our, our management committee here, is over 55. You have to be old, old, that old to run the meeting here. And they're all talking about what they want to do. Some of them wanted yoga programs. Some of them wanted a, a library. One of them wanted these programs. 
It's up to them. It's open space. But the cool thing was the following. This space increased a number of different aspects of social capital. It increased belief in efficacy, that I can make a difference. It, in being part of this, increased social ties, having more friends. It also increased a sense of place. So again, this is one project bringing it all together. You have a local community gone through disaster looking to build social ties. The Iba show is one of them. Now we have World Bank funding in two other countries as well. OK. So I tried to argue that in every stage of disaster, in the survival stage, the rebuilding stage, and the mental health recovery stage, social ties, social cohesion makes a big difference. Those neighbors, those people living nearby, the zero responders, they're the ones who save lives during the crisis. Then over time, the vertical ties between us and decision makers help bring in resources in the rebuilding process. And then as we need mental stability over time, those neighbors, those people with you in that process, help us feel together that we're in it as a group. Now, if that's the case again, we have measurable programs that change social capital. Much of the money that we spend, unfortunately, whether it's through FEMA, through USAID, or other organizations, is about physical infrastructure. We're worried about bridges and roads. We're worried about fire breaks and berms. We don't spend enough on social infrastructure. Thank you.
You know, we look around the room, we have our city administrator, you know, who's from the city administrator's office? Yep. County administrator's office, I apologies. Uh, again, we are we're city and county, so we get it backwards. That's all we do is resilience, right? Even this courtyard and buildings in here, they're all committed to some form of the resilience equation, right? So what I mean by that, well, let's take what is resilience, right? So what is a resilient city? Well, it's the built environment, right? Every time I come in Santa Rosa, you're built something new, right? It's either a road or a building or a bridge or something you put underground. In the city, we have the same investments we're making. There's our new billion dollar hospital uh, with Zuckerberg slapped all over it. Uh, but we have our systems too, you know? So we have our sewer system, which is right here, our new uh, Trans Bay Metro system, and one of the largest solar panel arrays in any city in America, you know, generating power on top of our new our, our water storage system in the west of the city. So I'm sure you're investing in all that too, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and our institutions, right? So our, we have this important infrastructure that we need to keep thriving and succeeding. And so of course, our faith, um, academic, and of course, our municipal um, institutions. And then of course, our economy, uh, which a big chunk of it is tourism. I know that's one of the big issues up here in Sonoma right now is keeping people up here, spending money, participating, creating jobs. But we also have our tech and actually, you know, we have our UCSF. UCSF is actually the largest employer in the city and county of San Francisco, not the city. It generates $14 billion of economic impact across the whole Bay Area. How many people live in Sonoma County do you think that work for the UCSF uh, institution, for example? I bet a whole bunch. Did you know that 25% of the employees of the city and county of San Francisco live in Sonoma County? Did you know that? 25%. And about 100% of the retirees, because they're all cops and firemen, they live just down the street. And my, our pension is keeping this economy floating, apparently. So, <laughs> congratulations, you won. Because uh, I'm paying the taxes at the end of that pension. So, but there are also our communities, right? So we have our LGBT community, our Latino community, our African American community, our Russian community our tech community, our bike community, all these affinity groups and, and other folks that live in our community. And this is what it's all about, right? Because, you know, isn't that what Sonoma County is all about? Isn't that what our, we have our river community, we have our vineyard community, we have our, you know, restaurant community, we have all these great communities up here, and it's an important part of identification. So, let's talk about what is a community, though. So really quickly, you know, the way we look at it, we believe it's individuals, we believe it's about organizations. So here's Glad Memorial Church, a new Chinese hospital downtown, the, um, the Bayview YMCA, which is our anchor institution in Bayview. These are really important organizations, right? And our networks, right? So we have our civic networks, and these are people that are working on land use, and then we have our political networks, this is the Democratic Club and District 11, and then here, of course, are our affinity groups that are working on planting trees. So right now, at this point, do you guys have all this stuff? Right? Well, yeah. So just, I'm going to split, level set this conversation because the bottom line is whenever San Francisco shows up in a meeting and starts talking, so all of a sudden, you yeah, know, you have an $11 billion budget, right? That's true. And we also run an airport, the largest water system west of the Mississippi, and when you back all that out and the federal grants, we have a little over a billion dollars to run a city and a county with a million people. So when you do those numbers, you realize, yeah, you know, we do have a billion dollars, but we have a million people, right? So when you start adding out the numbers, guess what? When you get down to the per person budget level, at least Sonoma County and Santa Rosa, we have a lot more in common, right? And, and we're dealing with a homeless problem that's pretty bad right now. Are you? Yeah. We're dealing with a massive housing problem. Are you? Yeah. Are we dealing with insufficient funding for our schools? Are you? Yes. Right? <laughs> Traffic, congestion, this, this, and this. So in the end, we have maybe taller buildings in our downtown, but we're waking up with the same scramble things that you are. So, what is community resilience? Well, first of all, these are the core tenets of our approach, right? Connection. And Daniel did a great job elevating the prior to that. I can't reiterate that. Well, connection, right? We also believe in capacity. And so, we really want to believe in that increasing people's ability to contribute to their individual resilience and their collective resilience is a top priority for our work. And resources. We really believe it's important to have resources available in our communities for people to use every day and during times of stress. Not rocket science, right? So let's go to how this journey started for me personally, and that was 
And, uh, and it's ironic, too, I haven't really thought about it, but we both sort of jump off on New Orleans, right? And New Orleans, I think, for a lot of people, was a bellwether moment. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you look at those times, like, where were you on 9-11? Um, uh, it just sort of like rings true, like, where were you? And I know where I was. I was sitting at a barbecue on Labor Day weekend, and I saw the storm coming to New Orleans. I turned to and I said, you're about to witness the greatest natural disaster in the history of America ever televised. And people were like, what are you talking about? You just watch. And sure enough, it went exactly as I expected. And it was a tragedy, right? So two years later, <clears throat> Mayor Newsom, now Lieutenant Governor of Cabo Newsom, who's actually the champion for my work from day one. And so possibly if he wins, you'll be hearing a lot more about this work. Um, really said, you know what? We got to figure out how we can help New Orleans. So he sent me and city administrator Ed Lee down to New Orleans to see what we can do. And Mayor Lee, when he got there, realized that there's a lot we could learn. And so it was for him a, a trip for back to the future. Because when you take out the impact of an earthquake and you remove uh, the, the water after a flood, you really realize that the outcomes are very similar, right? So the impact from the earthquake, the impact from the flood left the same damage, right? Now here's a you know a picture that you know immediately in San Francisco, people are like, oh that's a Burning Man art piece, right? Like house and car wrestle, house wins, right? Well, you know, it's a rather amazing image, but when you really think about it for a second, you wait, wait a minute. You know, I remember when I was a kid playing in the bathtub and I had all these toys and I'd spin the water around and they all smash at each other. I mean, really think about the wave energy it would take to make that scenario happen. And that house wasn't there before, and neither was that car, right? So think about what it must have been like in the ninth ward when it filled up with water. It wasn't just like the bathtub going up, it was a torrent. Now, all of you think about your favorite grandmother, grandfather, and aunt. And I want you to throw them in that bathtub for 14 hours. Because that's what happened to Felicia Thibodeau, who was here with me the last time I presented. That's what happened to her grandmother. And they never found her body. And you know what? They had three days' notice that that was coming. Now, ask yourself. Did they have to be left behind to swim in that bathtub? Well, in a way, the way the city had approached emergency management, in, at least in New Orleans, was you need to self-evacuate to get out of harm's way. Now, how much money does the poorest neighborhood in the poorest city in America have in their back pocket on the last day of the month? Who here works with seniors and people on social security and disability? Any here for seniors? Anybody know any seniors? Anybody on Social Security? Right? You're not right now buying that new set of golf clubs on the 28th. You're buying it on the 3rd. So basically what this message was, was I hope you can swim. Because you're not going to get out of harm's way. Because they knew the levees were going to fail. Right? And they knew that the people would be trapped there in their homes. And so the bottom line is, you know, Daniel and I, we kind of whip up a lot of humor and make this a light thing because Frankly, it's kind of a morose subject and we don't get invited to a lot of dinner parties unless we promise not to talk about disasters. But the truth is, is that this is what it's all about. And I don't even really remind you of this because frankly, you had your moment just recently, you know, and I think we all know the scorecard that we all as public officials have to be held accountable for. And that was, did everybody survive? No. Well then guess what? More work to do. And what you have to do is sort of stand back like Daniel say and say, well, then who didn't make it and why? And when you realize that there was a pattern, possibly, that you could see within the people that maybe didn't successfully negotiate the recent fires, then guess what? The good news is you have a roadmap to do something about it. How many people think now, looking back at what happened here in the fires, that maybe we could have done something differently to make sure that everybody could have gotten harm's way? No blame involved, but it's a weak thing, right? Right? Well, I mean, I, I'm going to propose to you a system I think actually we believe would contribute to our success that maybe would work up here. So we did find beauty, and here it is, the Broadmoor Improvement Association, led by Hal Mark and Latoya Cantrell. Latoya was just a, another member of the community that post Katrina said, you know what, I'm going to help rebuild my neighborhood. Well, guess what? Four years after this photo was taken, she was elected to city council. And two weeks ago, she was sworn in as the first woman mayor of the city of New Orleans. So one thing to remember is this. Even when a disaster happens and horrible things occur, 
beautiful things can happen. And in my opinion, the, the leadership of Latoya Cantrell, who's committed to community, is unprecedented. As the mayor of New Orleans, is a significant, beautiful thing to happen for New Orleans. Considering the jackass that ran that town, right, during the recovery process, embezzled millions of dollars, patted his buddy's pockets, completely failed in recovery, and now the city of New Orleans, less than 50% of the people that lived there before ever came back. Is that a successful recovery? I mean, they have the Super Bowl, but is the, is the annual Mardi Gras parade really a community celebration or more of a morning memory dance? Because most of the people that worked at those parades aren't there anymore. So it's just important to understand that there are a lot of layers to this work, but beautiful things happen when people actually rise up. What we did is we helped them rebuild the elementary school in their neighborhood, and we actually helped um, secure a grant and create a Wi-Fi network from the elementary school to the library, which the Carnegie Foundation helped build. So the city and county of San Francisco took all the contractors that do work for us and had them write the applications so they could get, win the grant. And now we have the first LEED Platinum Certified Elementary School in Louisiana history in this neighborhood, which before, none of, our, none of us would want to send our children to that school considering what the dilapidated mess it was. So again, another positive thing that came out of Hurricane Katrina. So, Mayor Lee came back and literally over alligator at the Houston airport, tried alligator, uh, said, you know what, this whole idea you have about neighborhood empowerment, that's a secret for a disaster response and recovery. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, let me explain to you why. Well, his vision turned into uh, grants and awards from the Centers for Disease Control. We just won a big award two years ago from the Ash Center on uh, top 10 civic innovations in the country, so people are even looking at this now, it's just disaster resilience, it's civic innovation, and FEMA and the UNISDR have recognized our work um, for as being a best practice. Who's in our universe? Well, guess what? When I wake up every day, the first call I make is not to the fire department. The first call I make is to all these amazing people, to Department of Technology, our biggest partners in the Department of Health, we just got a massive grant for them, but the PUC, the Unified School District, our CERT team, Mayor's Office Data Services, the Fire Department, Public Works, every agency in the city and county of San Francisco is committed to the resilience of our neighborhoods. And let's face it, as taxpayers, isn't what we're paying for, right? It's like we want the government to be thinking about 100 years out, not 100 minutes like my kids are when they're looking at how much more time they get screened before they go to bed. Um, our nonprofit partners, there are just a mountain of agencies out there that are working on resilience. It may be economic resilience, public safety resilience, health, but they're all connected to this movement in many different ways. And then our private sector partners. Our biggest sponsor for the last two years has been Microsoft, right? And then lastly, our academic institutions. And we're really blessed to have the great work uh, that we're doing with like MIT Urban Risk Lab, the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, San Francisco State, Mass University, but now our emerging partnership with my colleagues here at Northeastern. You know, academia loves this stuff. And I've been talking to folks at San Francisco Sonoma State and saying, what are you doing to get involved out there? Because you know what? Their students and faculty want to get involved. And that's millions of dollars of technical support and expertise that you can harness during this recovery phase. And that's what they're doing in Christchurch, New Zealand, in their recovery work. Let's jump back into New Orleans again. The Ninth Ward, not a pretty sight. But how much water fell in New Orleans? on the day Katrina struck. How many, how many inches or feet? Any ideas? What do you think? Is it inches, inches or feet? Feet. Ah, Who wants to say inches? Three inches? Three inches? All right, there you go. He wins. He wins with his brand new, oh, that was a good handoff right there. I was trying to do the bank side. Uh, one of our USB drives. Yes, two inches of rain actually fell that day in New Orleans. Look at all that carnage. Look at what happened in New Orleans. You see all the darkest areas where all the flooding was. And so when you step back, you realize, well, wait a minute. Maybe the idea of doing self-evacuation was not a bad idea for the areas that we knew probably weren't going to get flooded. Maybe, though, we should have had a you know, divided plan and focus on the folks that were at most at risk, because they knew the levees were going to fail, because they'd been under engineered. So maybe what they should have said is for part of the city to self-evacuate, and for the rest of the city, we're going to get you out of harm's way. Now look at San Francisco, 49 square miles of insanity surrounded by reality, and parts of Sonoma County have that same problem. Yes, I've been to Sebastopol. And the bottom line is, is that in, in our city, we're divided into these little neighborhoods. Why? Why is that? What divides Santa Rosa? 
Right. What divides San Francisco? Hills. The hills. How many hills are in San Francisco? 150. 150? Stop cheating. <laughs> yeah, we have 73 hills in San Francisco. That's Rome, sir. And how, I know you had a great time in Rome when you visited. We have seven hills in Rome, right? So we have 73 hills in San Francisco, which creates these little micro neighborhoods, right? But those of you that understand seismology and understand soil performance and understand sea level rise, what else does that do? It creates a myriad of conditions, right? So do you think the earthquake that we are going to have, the big one, will impact me? I live on top of Mount Davidson the same way it impacts the people in the marina? No. Do you think we are probably should think about shaping our messaging around disaster resilience, considering the different risks that each neighborhood has? Of course, right? So again, here is the marina in 89. Who remembers 1989 who was, who was around, right? With real living in the area, right? It's pretty, pretty intense up here. I bet you have a little, little action, right? Guess what? That was an earthquake. That was a Santa Cruz earthquake. You ask me in downtown Santa Cruz, it was on, it was end of the world, right? Buildings collapsing, people being trapped. San Francisco and the North Bay, we had a little bit of a touch, but that really wasn't a earthquake. Who felt the Hayward Fault the other night? The little pop that we had? Yeah? We did in San Francisco. I was actually at an emergency planning meeting. Who remembers the earthquake that uh, was in the 60s here in Santa Rosa? Yeah, how was that? Yeah, bad news, huh? Was there a lot more people living here then or less? Yeah, there were a lot less buildings or more back then. Yeah, a lot less infrastructure, right? Yeah. So the reality is, is like our memory is sort of conditioned because Loma Prieta, that's a dangerous thing. Because that was not what you should be thinking about. We should be thinking about the earthquakes of 54, 60, 1906. That's what a town living on a loam or basically a watershed should be thinking about all the time. Right? Because I've been to Christchurch, New Zealand. I like to take you all up and take you to Christchurch, New Zealand and see what's going to happen in Santa Rosa, California. Because you have the exact same soil building performance and it's going to be something else. Right? I only share that with you because the reality is I work for you in theory because I'm paid by the federal government and I got to go to Christchurch, New Zealand and see what happened there. And if I don't come back and tell you what I saw, am I doing my job? And the reality is in zones like this where there's high water levels because of rivers and creeks and streams and the soil, you're going to have huge soil performance issues. So maybe the buildings won't fall, but you won't be able to drive through blocks. Because all the roads are going to collapse, right? And what takes out the sewer and the natural mines and all those things as well. So who's going to end up holding the bag on that? So my friend at the school board, right? What's your family reunification plan if there's no roads accessible to your building after the disaster? How are the parents going to be able to get to the school to pick up their kids if they can't even pull out their driveway? Right? How long, how many, how many, do you have a, do you do food production on site or do you do just in time meals at your schools? Uh, yeah, so the just in time meal schools, how much food do they have in storage there to feed children for three days after an earthquake? That's the one we have to ask ourselves, right? Because it's about the kids. So look at the city and county of San Francisco again. You can see here's all the demographic information. Bottom line is we see where the liquefaction zones are. We see where people are over 65 years of age. We see where people are living alone. We see where people are living with disabilities. We have all this data. So, you know, that's the beauty of the world now. We have all this data. What's the danger now? I do something about it. Right? 1960, people just knew sort of where people were. Now we know where everybody is. So the Empower Communities Program. So this is the program we created. What's our approach? Well, we plan with people, not for them. Right? Why? Because in the end, we need people to adopt very specific behaviors in order to help themselves survive after disaster, right? Especially if they're beyond their own. Well, the truth is, is that if you write the plan for them, they're not probably going to have any ownership of implementing it, right? So this is very much a bottom-up approach. What we're excited about is the fact that every tool that I, I want to share with you, we design with people, not for them as well. We even have some consulting firm come in get a bunch of charting capabilities, disappear, come back two months later with a binder, throw on the table and say, can we have our million dollars now? That's not what we did. We literally have gone out and iteratively built this system over 10 years with every possible economic condition community you can imagine, from the Bayview all the way up to Miraloma Park. So the system we've created is actually designed by residents, many of whom might be the kinds that you work with every day, for residents that you want to help downstream. Everything we build has to be scalable, duplicatable, and sustainable. 
So it can't just work in the baby, but not and not work in Diamond Heights or work in Pacific Heights. It has to work everywhere. And so far, we've onboarded 12 neighborhoods, and one, not one neighborhood has backed out of using our system. We've also successfully now launched in, in Fruitvale, Oakland, California, and really excited about the prospects of working with Santa Rosa because we really believe uh, strongly that this system can work anywhere people who care about each other live. We offer real value for our stakeholder organizations from all sectors at all levels. How many people here think it's really easy to engage small businesses about disaster resilience? Right? So the truth is, is that if you don't come up with a strategy that makes everyone, everyone to buy in and stay in, you probably don't have a strategy. You probably have a grant that you have to spend the next six months. Right? So the bottom line is, this has to be a systemic approach that every agency and organization and community adopts and then sticks to it. Why? Because, guess what? We don't know if the big one's going to happen today, tomorrow, or 20 years from now, but in between, a lot of small stuff happens that this system can help. And I'll show you how. Uh, we also, we want to drive ownership of the neighborhood levels through the transfer of power. And the truth is, is that I think government actually has really created a scenario now where in our effort to demonstrate value, we've actually tried to onboard people's responsibilities for their own safety and well-being. And guess what? We realize all of a sudden we can't possibly take care of everyone's safety and well-being all at once. So now we're realizing maybe we should give some back. And I'm okay with giving some back. What do you guys think? Want to give some responsibility back to our people, right? Would you like people to take responsibility, like maybe participate in the kids' education a little bit more? Yes. Yes, that'd be a great idea, right? So just advancing that, this is a time where I think it's okay to say let's transfer the power back. So we go to neighborhoods and we set up hubs. So a hub is a network of community serving organizations from all sectors, right? So public, private, philanthropic, faith-based, whoever it is, civic networks included, that are committed to working together on their individual resilience, right? So every school, every uh, CBO, every business has a continuity of operations plan. Does everybody here know what a continuity of operations plan is? Show of hands, yes, no. How many of you are managed organizations with boards and have finance and payroll? Great. So the county of operations plans make sure that regardless of whatever shock comes to your, your organization, you can regroup and continue to serve and meet the needs of your community you serve. And the reality is, is that unfortunately, a lot of institutions, big and small, fail to really have thriving effective county of operations plan. And when they do find out they don't have one is when it's too late. And so the bottom line is, is that one of the primary investments we make is at that level is working with our local organizations. So what happens? Well, pre-event, what we do is we identify an anchor institution in the neighborhood, right? It could be a YMCA. In my neighborhood, it's our neighborhood association. It could be a fantastic faith-based organization that runs a food pantry and does senior programming. We all know those organizations in neighborhoods, right? Why? Because they're the first people we always call that list our neighborhood meetings, right? So we go to those folks and we say, you care about this community, you're investing in this resilience every day, we want to make sure that we can handle anything that comes our way. Will you be an anchor institution and leverage your political capital to bring the other agencies in the community to the table? They say yes. Then we can bring all the other agencies in the community and bring them together and say, let's talk about what you think the risks are and the hazards are in the community and how we can work together on it. Now, in some neighborhoods in San Francisco, it's a tsunami. In other neighborhoods, it's a heat wave. In other neighborhoods, it's an earthquake. But in some neighborhoods, it's violence. The truth is, is I don't care what issue it is that's keeping you up at night. If it keeps, gets you in the room and keeps you there and compels you and your organization to make behavior changes in order to be able to work together to push back on that shock and maybe ultimately mitigate its impact, great. But I'll tell you right now, in the city and county of San Francisco, I'm beginning to do a lot more work with the police department because I'm beginning to realize the police department and their community policing model, the target capabilities they get from building safer neighborhoods, actually are the same ones we need for responding to disaster, right? So we have to disrupt this conversation a little bit. I've sort of moved a bit away from my emergency management teams, which are really sort of really structured to focus on response, and now I'm working with folks that are working on mitigation. I just secured a $150,000 grant from the Department of Health to start working on climate change and heat waves. Well, guess what? If you get a neighborhood to come together and learn how to work together to mitigate the impact of heat waves on their seniors and children, and have organizations be able to step in and help them and need your help, you've just accomplished 90% of the target capabilities you need to respond to an earthquake. And guess what? 
We've been talking about earthquakes for 20 years. We still haven't had one, but they had two lethal heat waves last year in the Bayview. Everybody wants to talk about that. Awesome. Right? It's like going up to the person you wanted to ask out for a date in 10 years. And you're like, hey, would you like to go out and get sushi next week? And you're like, oh, I don't like sushi. Oh, okay, let's not go out. No, of course you say, how about Italian? Right? When everyone goes, you know, so that was it, Maria's up here, whatever, right? So bottom line is, is that you need to meet people where they are and find out what they care about and start from there. Right? I guarantee you, I'm working very close to the school board. I'd love to talk about the strong school board we're working right now. Parents with children care more about disaster resilience than millennials in a hat sack game. So parents are one of the biggest opportunities to start moving the needle in our neighborhoods. You want to know why? Because now they care more about their kids than they care about themselves. And people don't really care about themselves in this country. If they did, we wouldn't have people drinking and driving, texting while they drive, smoking, jaywalking, all this other crazy stuff. But the minute they identify someone that they care about, they will change their behavior for it. And I really believe your school districts all give you a chance to change this conversation. You want to know why? Because we couldn't get people to start wearing seatbelts in this country until the kids started being the champions for it. We couldn't stop cigarette smoking in this country until we told kids it was a bad thing to do. Right? So we need to start looking at the health uh, community more about behavior change modeling and realizing that disaster resilience behavior change can build on these same successful things. So we get our, our, um, this, our neighborhood organization table, and then we're now working at the neighborhood level. Because like you, our neighborhoods are full. We have these suburban neighborhoods with single-family dwelling homes with no CBOs or faith-based organizations really working with those communities. But they're the ones that have all the seniors that are living in them now, right? So we have a brand new program called the Block Champion Program, and that program builds on the neighbor fest strategy, which I'll share with you in a second. So this has been our killer app. And what's sad is that it's been in front of us the whole time. Who here in, in the city of Santa Rosa is responsible for issuing permits for street closures? You need a, do you need a permit to close a street in Santa Rosa? Parks. Yes. So who would it be? Parks. Parks. So, uh, is Parks here? Wow, really? Like the largest sheltering place out after the earthquake? That department should be here at the table. Did you know that in San Diego, after the fires, they actually now moved their care and shelter branch into the Parks Department because they ended up being responsible for the shelters anyhow? But ask the Parks Department, how many permits did you issue last year for block parties or any kind of events, right? And the bottom line is what we realize is that people all over the city are coming together all the time at the block level to engage and get to know each other and become more connected. So we created the Neighbors Best program, and what we do is we actually give them a toolkit to learn how to throw the world's greatest block party. But guess what? We actually have show them how to use the incident command system to build a hyper-local team to mine their neighborhood for skills and talent and resources. We show them how to communicate with their community, how to organize their event, how to host their event. On the day of their block party, we show up and we actually provide, a, show up with a, a map of their neighborhood and we simply say, hey, if there's an earthquake and there's no food and water coming out of the pipes and things like that, where would you find food and water and medical and power in your neighborhood if it was, if all the light lights turned on? And they're like, wow, and so it's a game. And guess what, people? The whole world's about maps. So if you walk into any meeting with a map right now, you're the, you're the most popular person in the room. So we just show up with a map in their neighborhood, and we show them the resources that they have. And then they learn how to do mass feeding. They're building connection and social cohesion. We have the fire department and the police department there. Here's our local CERT team from one of their programs. And here's my son, Ajaxio, right here. And what does he have in that bin? Well, Recology which is our vendor partner in San Francisco, donates a bin of disaster supplies to every neighbor fest. Gloves, helmets, first aid kit, this clean, all the things that we know we need to use to help people shelter in place after disaster. So at the end of the block party, guess what? They've got a bin of disaster supplies, they've got a disaster plan for where they're gonna get their resources, they have a team of people that know how to organize a feeding, and they have all these folks that have moved to the neighborhood and never met each other first time connecting, right? Not bad, you wanna know why? Because you know how much planning I had to put on into that, organizing that event? None. How many people here have ever had to organize a meeting for your like department and literally showed up and for less than two hours made contact with 15 or 20 people, which was great, but spent 20 hours planning that event and hosting it and dealing with the logistics? Right? You did. And you walk out there and you say, 
If I had spent that 20 hours just standing on the corner of the clipboard, I probably could have talked to more people and got more done. Well, guess what? We actually got all these people out to a party, not a meeting with a PowerPoint, got them engaged to talk about becoming more connected, assembled a team that now knows how to work together to meet the needs of the community after disaster, right? And we gave them a big bit of this place to do the work until we get there. And you know how many hours I put in pre-event? Zero. I just kept track of the address and showed up. How many look at that's a great program to use? <laughs> right? And guess what? You know how many city agencies are partnered on this program? 25. The PUC, the Rec and Park Department, the library. You know why? Because they all want to talk to them too. So the Neighbor Fest program isn't just a program for the fire department or the police department. It's a program for the city. Because you know what? These people need to learn about all the amazing things all your agencies are doing. And the time to do it is when they're having a good time, not when they're showing up yelling at you at a meeting. Which is importantly when we usually hear from these folks, right? So, very powerful. Last year we had 35 of these events all over the city, but the communities again took it to the next level. These are normally just block party events. Well, guess what? They said some of our neighborhoods can't afford to host their own block party for financial reasons. So they said we're just going to host one for the whole neighborhood. So some of the events we did in the Bayview, the Oh My, and Your Loma Park, over 500 people showed up at these events. So the pivot then comes to the Block Champion program. And this is where Neil gets excited because he loves the champions. Does anyone know the Warriors game? So we're paying attention. Mm -hmm. Shh. No, it's <laughs> So uh, the Block Champion program is going to be our vision for taking those hosts and then during the disaster, putting them to work, right? So pre-event now, in addition to that program, we have just developed a new NET training center. We're listing all the trainings that are available for people um, that are uh, through all of our partners. We just launched the NET Leadership Academy with Coro, which is our new big partner, because the bottom line is we have a massive die-off in our leadership in our neighborhoods. The people that moved in neighborhoods with families 35 years ago and joined the Neighborhood Association and have been running ever since are leaving us. And the new generation of homeowners really aren't filling in the gaps. And the reason why is because it's kind of intimidating running a neighborhood now. In the good old days, everyone knew the mayor, right? And it's pretty easy to go to City Hall and get someone to pay attention to you. Now our systems are so much more complex. Like, do I talk to the county? Do I talk to the city? Do I talk to the council person? Do I talk to a supervisor? Not to mention the land use and all the other requirements. They're like, I don't have time to learn all this. I don't want to jump into this hot tub. So we're creating a leadership academy now where for four months we train them on how the city works and how to be an effective leader for their community. And our new strong program, schools, congregations, and organizations. Powerful new toolkit, more than happy to share with you. Because in the end, the CBOs and the local institutions are the biggest anchors to your response and recovery process in everyone. During the event, our neighborhoods activate their neighborhood emergency operations center, and all the different locations become service providers. They can become an information hub, a shelter, a mass feeding center. How many of your schools, for example, are currently set up to become Red Cross shelters? Two. Two. How many of your schools possibly were activated as shelters during the fire? Two. Two. Officially or unofficially? Officially. Okay, and unofficially, how many did? Two. Yeah, see? And that was a relatively small event, right? So when you have an earthquake, the whole entire valley is going to become a spontaneous shelter location. Why? Because people can't go anywhere. So whatever the nearest building is that they think they can shelter in, they're going to go to. So how do we do in the end? Well, when we approach a community and decide to participate, the first thing we do is we ask them after the neighborhood. Where are all the resources you might need during a severe time of stress? And where are all, who are all the agencies that work with the most vulnerable populations? Once we get all those names, we bring them all together, and we say, hey, why don't we start communicating with each other now instead of meeting on the dashboard of a, or on the hood of a truck in a parking lot at 3 in the morning after a major earthquake, right? The reason why we want to know who these folks are and why, because we can work with them to now build customized culture and conflict preparedness messaging so that they will not be clients after the disaster, but rather partners during the disaster. We then run a tabletop exercise, and this is what we ran at City Holiday, where we actually come in and help them figure out, this is a real neighbor in San Francisco, the Ocean Avenue, this is the one we ran with them, how they would set up and run a central shelter, how they would learn how to shelter, a set of 250 people sheltering in place, and how to run a mass feeding center for 500 people. 
I guarantee you, if you went around Sonoma County and talked to a lot of communities that contributed to your response space spontaneously, guess what they were doing? Mass feeding, central shelter, and helping those shelter in place. Would that be a surprise? The good news is, is that it sounds like it went pretty well up here, right? But the reality is, is that if you just one or two people fall between the cracks, then that's what everyone talks about, right? So this is our strategy to get these folks talking right now so that they'll be able to seamlessly work together um, when things don't go right. So in a nutshell, we know where it will happen, we know who will be impacted, and we know who will be the first responders. And guess what? It's these people. The people you talk to every day, your neighbors, your friends, your constituents, your commissioners, your teachers, your faith-based leaders. So let's get to work. That's working in the same system.